Hello. Hello. I'm Daniel. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Oh, you're not talking to me. <laughs> this, is, this is the general bit for everybody else to start again. Hello. Hello, Danny. <laughs> Sorry, I went into I, I knew this was going to be like this. No, no. Okay. no Here we go. All right. <laughs> I think I'll switch your video off so I can't see you. Right? <laughs> this is not going to work. Anyway. Oh, by the way, I've put on the Facebook page the picture of you with looking through your new window and I, I said to people I might explain why you look like something out of The Shining. You remember? You just you put your window in your kitchen when Thomas, Stefan and I turned up. Oh yeah. We yeah. might get to talk about your window. But anyway, okay. right, here we go. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Daniel Hello. Mills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're Daniel Mills. <laughs> yes, you know that, but other people might not. You're you're known. I'm not. That's the that's the big deal here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's see if we can go with this. Um, hello. <laughs> hello. I'm Daniel Mills, and I'm professor of veterinary behavioural medicine at the University of Lincoln, and I consider myself to be very lucky. Amongst the luck that I've had was the opportunity to go to the US when I was a student and meet some of the pioneers in the field of veterinary behaviour. And I've asked four of them that I met at that time if they'd do uh, me the favour of having a podcast with me. Uh, the first one was with Cathy Hout and my second one is with Ian Dunbar. Uh, all of these people have been really generous by taking me in as a student into their homes and really didn't know anything about me at the time and I'm very pleased to say that uh, remained friends with them ever since. In my typical bumbling style, I, I didn't really think things through and perhaps realise that, realized at the time just how lucky I'd been and how important these people were in their own right. Anyone who knows me will know that also that I'm quite impulsive and so I have a tendency not to think through my actions. But given the generosity of others, this has worked really well for me. So when I went to the US in the 1980s and hitchhiked my way across the USA, and there is a story in that, I didn't realise that it was illegal in half the states, I think, that I um, hitched in. But anyway, um, I just turned up on people's doorsteps and they welcomed me. Um, anyway, I thought this idea of having podcasts would be fun. I haven't really thought it through. This is the second one and I've been sort of encouraged by my youngest son, Thomas, who will do some editing perhaps. Um, but here I am and I'm really grateful for the fact that, as I said, the four people that I've asked have all... Um, instantly said yes and we'll see how these conversations go they're not scripted um, and I suspect with Ian that there's going to be quite a few um, interruptions as I try to control myself with some of his stories um, and, but I also apologize if I say something that's not quite right no harm is meant I'm, I don't always say things that are politically correct um, just want people to get I want people to get to know um, these pioneers because I think it's really important to understand the people behind the ideas. And today's guest is someone I could say so much about. He's not only a pioneer, but also a celebrity in the dog behaviour world. However, I'll start with an anecdote. Uh, we met several times in the UK uh, at some of his amazing global lecture tours at that time. And then when I visited him in the US, uh, and then I visited him in the US when I did my grand tour. And I'm very proud to say that I have my name carved in his garden. And perhaps we'll end up talking about that as well. And um, I'll post a picture to show the evidence that it's still there unless he's tiled over it since the, the last year or so. Um, we spent a lot of time gardening and we both are keen gardeners and chatting um, about various things. And I remember saying to him, why did you think that you know, a student coming halfway across the world would be happy to spend time chatting with you in the garden? And I remember your reply was, well, anyone who goes halfway around the world shortly before their finals is trying to get away from something. As always, Ian's insights were spot on. So welcome, Ian, and welcome to this podcast. Hi. <laughs> People may not understand where that hi comes from, but every time I said hello when we kicked off, <laughs> Ian went and said hello back to me. So we you can do, do several outtakes. takes. We'll, outtakes. Most of it will be yeah, on the we'll outtakes. Anyway, how are you doing? It's pretty I'm hot here. Yeah, very well. I'm taking it easy. I'm sequestered away in a very lovely place. I'm on an old horse property with a vineyard up the hill, sitting in the pool room. There's the swimming pool. It's going to be in the 90s next week. Oh, in the 30s, I guess I should say. And um, 
I'm reading lots. Um, I've really slowed down on the work side, you know, I, because Jamie and Kelly run it all now, you know, that um, it's wonderful. That's a nice way to be, isn't it? Um... Well, it's, you know, it's really interesting how, when I think how I, I mean, I busted my gut going all over the world, you know, the last five years, I was nine months a year in hotels, you know, in Japan, in Australia, you know, all over. And now, I don't travel at all, yet I reach more people. You know, if I went live on Facebook, I, I would have 30,000 people within just a couple of minutes. Well, you know, I've got, I got some news for you. These podcasts at the moment have 100 people subscribed. Woo! <laughs> so well, anyway. That's why I shall give it a push on my oh, well. Facebook page. And, you know, that'll go out to about 50,000. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, as I said, and it, I mean, these podcasts have been a lot of fun. Um, uh, you know, I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for. I'm not great with technology, but it's just been great to have these chats. And they are chats. And as I said, in your case, you said you don't want to know what we're going to talk about. You don't want any plans. Let's just see where it goes. And I remember, you know, we talked many times about the idea of a TV show where we'd sit in a forest somewhere with a group of people yeah. chatting. <laughs> and that one never came off. But uh, but you are, you, you know, one of the things about you, though, is that you do have this sort of celebrity status, but you're one of the people who's still very well respected by academics, I think, you know? Um, yeah, there might be people who are jealous of your success and whatever, but, you know, a lot of people who have that celebrity status in the dog training world yeah, you take a big sigh, <laughs> deep, deep in, take a breath before you talk about them. Um, I mean, you really know your stuff um, and you talk, you know, there's, there's so much, you know, that when you just chat with you that comes out and you think, yeah, that's a really good insight. You really know your dogs. And I mean, maybe sort of let, let's start by just talking a little bit about your background. You know, how did you end up? You're, you're a vet as well as me. Um, um, you ended up working with Beach, a very famous researcher in um, the US on uh, reproduction. But somehow you ended up with sort of what you're really known for is turning around puppies, the idea that you have to wait till dogs are six months to train them. Well, yeah, the, the research was actually on um, sexual differentiation. So all the many reasons why male and female dogs develop differently. And um, we we first studied um, mating behavior, of course, and then secondary sexual characteristics, uh, urination postures, um, of which, of course, uh, hierarchical position and aggression is one. And so that was my big focus, looking at the development of social hierarchies, um, sex differences. And there came a point in the study when I had beautiful results. We had this little group of male dogs and the king, Ken, died, the top dog. He was a beautiful top dog because you'd never heard him growl. He was just so cool, man. It's like, hey, can I have my bone back? And <laughs> no one ever threatened him, you know. And when he died, we replaced the dog. Uh, I think we all voted um, blindly. And, and it was a dog came in ranking second from bottom. But when we ran the hierarchy tests, we had a perfect inverse correlation with weight. So the top dog was Eddie, like the runt of the group. The second smallest dog was the second highest dog and so on. And this was perfect. I mean, the male hierarchy was set in stone. We tested it every day. It was always the same. How did you so test I, it? I, I, interest. How did you test it? We, we would use a valued commodity. You know, we usually used a big old oxtail, nice okay. juicy bone. Um, and we did it two ways, two dogs in there, and then we throw in the bone. So that's the equal opportunity test. And then we would tell after a dog has had undisputed possession of the bone for 90 seconds, we'd take him out, put him in a holding area. And then we had the equal opportunity, the, the affirmative action test, where the, the loser would get the bone to chew on for 30 seconds. And we let out the other dog. Uh, the exchange would be usually without a growl. That's the point of a hierarchy, of course, to prevent the need for growling and fighting in the course of normal everyday living. We had another test where we had a group of five dogs, um, or we had a group of 24 dogs, which was adults and puppies, and we throw in the bone, 
When a dog has it for 30 seconds, we pull him out, we throw the bone into 23 dogs and so on till we're down to one dog, then we let them in in reverse order. And as far as males were concerned, the hierarchy was the same every day. The bitches, of course, threw kind of a spanner in the works. Anyway, back to the hierarchy. When I looked at this, I realized to make sense of this, we have to have puppies. So I went into Dr. Beach, I showed him the results, he glanced at it because I'd shown it to my postdoc and my undergrads and, and they, didn't, they didn't get it. He got it like that. He says, all right, you can have your puppies because we knew it was a fluke. It didn't make sense. We had that, you know, what are the odds of that, of having five dogs in rank order, but the opposite to what it should be. Every other study on hierarchy showed that the advantage was to, the heavier you are, the bigger the advantage. And as was not just an inverse correlation, it was perfect. And when re researchers would come, I would get them to bet on who's the top dog here. And they would always pick Whip, you know, Vipper Snapper Wunderhund or Dunbar's Folly, as we called him. This, this dog was almost a waste of oxygen, but I loved him. And he was the he was the runt. He was the lowest ranking dog. But we'd make a fortune betting. Anyway, so we got puppies. And working with the puppies, a number of things came out where I thought, you know, breeders would love to know this. Like temperament, not only was it malleable, it could happen in an instant. You could absolutely make over the dog's temperament from being a total belligerent pain in the butt to a real nice low key individual and it happens like this. And I thought, wow, because at the time everyone thought temperament was set in stone, mm -hmm. you know, and it was immutable, it was due to genetic heredity. So we showed this enormous social influence. And so I'm thinking, oh yeah, puppies, puppies, we need, you know. But the big thing from, from what you said about the scientific background, when I got to California, I didn't realize you had to pay for education and I hadn't got any money. Back then you could only take 300 quid out of England. I, I had no money after two days and I lived off lettuce sandwiches for three months, you know? And so then they said, well, you haven't paid your fees. And I said, what fees? So I eventually wrote a letter to the president of the university and, and said, hey, look, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do this. I've, I've got to go home, but I now have no money to get home. I said, I, I'm on salary, but, but I, I won't get a check for two months. And he sort of looked at me and read my letter, which was really funny. It was a picture of a camel. And it said, uh, education's an eclectic beast, just like the camel. And I had arrows showing the hump represents this, a student from Japan, and, and the nose represented this, a, a French student. And, and how having these foreign students really, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of diverse education and the mix really helped education. So anyway, he looks at me and he says, oh, how long do you think it would take you to do a PhD? And I thought, and the first thought was, well, I've got to do research where the statistics are so robust. We, it passes what's known as the um, intraocular traumatic test. The results are so obvious when you grass it out in histograms before and after that the difference, the gap between the two populations hits you between the eyes. <laughs> so when you visualize the data, you know you don't actually don't need statistics because it's going to be point, you know, P.001. So before I answered him, I was thinking, what study can I do where all my, you know, P values are at least 0 0.01? And I said, um, yeah, I think I can do it in two and a half years. So he said, you've got a fee waiver for two and a half years. So once I did that study, and it only took me like three weeks to do the research and write it up, and it was the shortest, PH, second shortest PhD in psychology. And I think the third shortest in the university, the shortest PhD ever done was a math, a one page math group. Yeah. You know, which I, I was looking at all these, so, you know, what could I pass through? because I, I just couldn't afford to pay for education. But that then became my way of looking at research. I don't want to do like cognitive research or personality research where you have to use, you know, an analysis of variance and you're using statistics that you can't grasp in your head. So I only wanted to use statistics that I could explain to a child what the statistical formula 
does. Okay, one second. That's dogs. Dog. <laughs> shush, please. Dogs, shush. I'm recording. Thank you. Hey, do I have to come in there? Everyone knows what's going on here. I'm losing street cred. Thank you. Good dogs. <laughs> Sorry, we have um, five dogs in training at the moment. Oh, oh, no. So anyway, yeah, the, the whole thing about being an academic, I do research where the statistics are, are beautiful. And of course, what's the best research to do? Dog training. Why? Dog training is about behavioral change. You expect a massive difference if you're actually training the dog. And so I love being in that field and I've always been, I've always have quantified everything I've done. So as I'm training a dog, I, I have, I'm doing a running tally in my head of say, what is the response reward ratio? How many responses am I getting for every single food reward I give, et cetera, et cetera. What's the response reliability percentage? And so I quantify everything and, um, so that's when I talk about training it, it's not what I think, it's what I know, well, most of the time. <laughs> and um, sometimes I, I say things because I think, well, that'd be a good idea. And it's not actually true, but- um, Yeah, so, 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 <laughs> so just in relation to that, first of all, when you say that thing about stats, I know exactly where you're coming from. And I know there's a story that Conrad Lorenz, he did exactly the same, he said, I don't understand stats. I just keep doing the study until the results are obvious. Well, he got a Nobel Prize out of it, so it did nice. him all right. But you know, that's that's the other thing is an elegant experiment shouldn't need that complicated stats. And I, I find that now that, you know, so often I get comments from referees and they're saying, oh, you should do, you know, generalized linear mixed model. And I'm thinking, no, actually we have one hypothesis that we're interested in. And only if that is true, you know, and we can compare that mm -hmm. with the t-test or something like that. Does anything else follow rather than just chuck everything in and see what emerges? And there's this big problem, you know, in psychology, what they call the replicability um, crisis, because there's so many studies where people say, oh, P equals 0.05, there's a significant result, but they've, you know, they've tranched about a hundred different tests to get one result, which yeah. has a one in 20 chance of being by random. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear that. And sort of, yeah, there's the right smile and you say you're not always um, right, because just before we started recording, I said to Ian, um, do you mind if I tell you the results from um, a study? Well, that was inspired yeah, back in the 80s when I first met you. And this was, you know, the idea that if you're training a dog and you withhold the treat, you know, when it screws up, then fair enough, it learns that. But if you eat the treat in front of it, you might motivate it to work harder. That, well, that's what I understood that you said. And I've been thinking about it for a long time and a number of years I've offered it as a, as a possible um, student project. Well, this year I actually got a student, one of our master students to do it. And she's a really good trainer. And despite lockdown, she got people all over the place. She made these videos on YouTube. She did a really good job. I'll, I'll give her a name plug, Abby Hughes. Um, so if she sets up a business, you know, she's, she's good. And, yesterday we got the results and what i asked her to do um you know and i always say to my students look at your results get a feel for the data first because yeah the stats should just confirm what you can see and also too often students rush into complicated tests and then you look at the and you think no this must have screwed up on the stats because they, they just don't understand their data mm -hmm. but but anyway so we looked at it uh we did run a uh, actually a, a glm on it and because she did a crossover design. So half the dogs did um, the eating of the treat and half the dogs um, just had the treat withheld. And it was actually a discrimination task. And what came through was there's a massive effect of order. Um, so the second time they did it, actually, they'd, because they'd done a similar task before, they carried that over. So, um, but even when we teased out that effect, when we looked at the two differences, there, there was no difference uh, between the, the two conditions. But when we looked at the individual graphs, what we saw for the dogs where um, sort of basically they were, um, the treat was being withheld was sort of it gradually went up and eventually they reached criteria. For those that 
um, where the treat was e eaten, what happened was it started at a certain level and then actually went down. They just did nothing for about five or six trials. And then they learned at almost an identical rate as the ones that had just had the treat withheld. And we were, we were chatting about this yesterday and we were saying what, and, and Abby said that she got this feeling that actually they were just confused. And she thought that maybe seeing the human eat the food, they suddenly thought, oh, that food's not for me that you're holding. So she just wondered. So there's a nice little twist there. So even though, you know, we didn't get the result that, you know, I think that you might have uh, predicted, we just wonder. And so I said to her, well, look, you know, you've, you've perfected this method. We can ask this question so many times. If you have access to the dogs, let's look at some of these variables because let's see what the difference is. Perhaps if you give the dog a few treats beforehand for free, so they know that they can have that food and see whether that has the effect. So I'm not saying you're completely wrong yet. <laughs> But it, but you know, but I, I mean, I, well, I love doing those sorts of practical. Yeah, experiments. it's actually um, the the eating of the treat really has nothing to do to enhance the dog's learning. Where it comes from is um, I was showing people stylized data, you know, a learning curve, mm. um, which you've taken from say a dozen animals and averaged out. Looks pretty cool, but then I was showing them individual data. And I was saying, here's what you must be aware of and say the improvements going up um, that you're working with a dog and wow, he learns. And then bam, he throws one trial like this at you. I said, mm -hmm. you must not get upset when that happens. That's real data. So here is real data. Ooh, do, 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 wonderful. And then bam. And when you get that huge improvement and then drop, Trainers get frustrated, like, yeah. and the dog senses it. So I said, if ever you're upset in training, just show the treat to the dog and say, you could have had this. <clears throat> now, the purpose of that is not to, for the dog suddenly to suddenly magically learn the task. It's for you to let off your pressure valve. Yeah. Okay. You cannot train if you're getting upset. So, so that was, you know, what okay. it was about. But I, I love the fact it was done, and I would never do it twice in a row or yeah. three times in a row. I think in your study, you probably yeah. did it like eight times. Yeah. Um, we did lots of times every time they screwed up. So it, it took yeah, them. Yeah, it, it's when I get really like, I'm working with a dog and he's either totally blowing me off or yeah, he's doing really well. And then he suddenly regresses to a, an imbecile puppy. And so I just pause, eat the treat and we have a little conversation. It's not what I would call a training technique, but it makes me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's interesting because it's one of the things I say to people because, you know, with the debate over, you know, using punishment. And I couldn't believe until, you know, when I came um, to the States a couple of years ago and, and stayed with you with the boys, um, just how common shot colours are still in the States. You know, they've, okay. they've, they've, they're, I mean, they're still around in the UK. They've been banned under the animal welfare legislation in Scotland. So by default, they're not explicitly banned, but they, the government have said that under animal welfare legislation, we think that you shouldn't be using shock collars. Um, and yeah, so I, that's the first thing that really struck me is I, I couldn't believe that, you know, just how common, you know, because I was chatting to people and they say, you know, still probably the majority of dogs are trained with very aversive methods in the States. But one of the things that I talk to people about is, and I'm sure this probably came from one of your lectures, is that um also when i started to learn a bit about real behavior as well because you know i had no formal training i'm all self-taught um mm -hmm. but the when you learn with rewards biologically your brain is once you know what you have to do to get that reward the brain says what's the minimum i have to do to get that reward it's going to play brinkmanship from an evolutionary point of view whereas you don't get that with the punishment based because it doesn't pay you to think if I run a little bit slower, am I not going to get caught by the tiger? And that's one of the attractions, I think, for those that focus on punishment. But the problem is they're then left with a rigid response, whereas the brinkmanship means through differential reinforcement, you can get a better and better response. Oh, yeah. That's the skill of really good trainers is you, you start to move to that variable ratio and boom. You can get better and better um, in that level. But yeah, always for people to be aware of that brinkmanship, you're going to get caught out. The dog's going to see, you know, yeah, can I get something for nothing? 
And that's, the, you know, it's not being mean or anything like that. That's just natural biology. We all see what's the minimum we have to do yeah. when, when the rewards are predictable. I, um, yeah, I guess I look at it a slightly a, a different way. Uh, uh, firstly, reward training when done correctly is just pure in its simplicity and effectiveness. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Um, however, it's not being used um, properly now by so many people because they don't phase out food lures, they don't phase out the food rewards. So then they are now bribing, the dog blows off the bribe. So now they try to drive behavior by changing the antecedent, the bribe. And of course we know all behavior is driven by consequences. Mm -hmm. And I, I just stick to rewards, 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 but have some very sophisticated differential reinforcement schedules, which is the only schedule we use from the beginning. We never use a continuous schedule. We go straight in with the differential reinforcement schedule. So we are up to like a, res a response reward ratio of seven to one after just uh, four trials. You know, it, it's huge. I mean, I, I mean, we, we go, it goes like this. I mean, I'll do it for your, 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 your listeners. Um, how do I go it now? Hi puppy, I'm Ian, here's a tree. Come tree. Okay, come sit tree, come sit down, sit, stand down, stand. Right, so that is then um, what was that? Four treats, 10 behaviors. So it's 2.5 to one. Then we go, we repeat, come sit down, sit, stand down, stand, come sit down, sit, stand down, stand five times. Well, now that's seven behaviors for one treat. So right from the beginning, we're on differential reinforcement and, and which response gets the treat? Well, the quickest or the best. But the thing about, so that's the first thing, we must get back and use reward training properly, quickly. Um, but I think you're, I, I, about punishment, I must get this out, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'll let you go. Even if it worked properly, which it doesn't, so by definition, what you did was not a punishment because a punishment is defined by its consequences on the behavior. So if you didn't eliminate the problem in one trial or in one session, then you are not punishing. So what are you doing? Well, harassing or hurting or, or frightening. But even if it did work, and if you're a very good trainer, it could work. It's so insufficient because what are we trying to do in training? We have an idea of what we want the dog to do and we want him to do it. That idea is, I don't want you to do that, or that, or that, or that, or that, mm. or that, which is why punishment training takes forever, because there's so many wrong ways. There's only one right way. So even if we punish, all it does is stops the dog doing what he's doing. It doesn't get the dog doing what we want, which means the only way to accomplish this, and therefore the only feedback when the dog makes a mistake or is non-compliant, is verbal because it must be instructive. So if the dog's doing anything wrong, I would just say Rover sit, end of problem. That's it. About nearly every behavior problem you can think of, you know, um, licking his rear end, chasing the cat, you know, running out the front door, humping, it's all stopped, Rover sit. So by being instructive, and that is not, people call it a DRO or a DRI. No, we specifically want one behavior. The dog's barking, shush. The dog's chewing on your slippers, Rover, chew toy. The dog's running around, chasing the cat, Rover, bed. Or Rover, chew toy, bed, down, shush. You know, and so when we give instructive <clears throat> feedback, instructive reprimands, if you like, um, now we suddenly accelerate training. So this to me is the big thing about punishment. I, I don't even mention the fact that it's scary or, or hurtful or it hurts, uh, that it's inhumane. I don't even argue that because it's a knee jerk emotional response for people. I just say, you know, even if it worked, it's insufficient. So we want to stop dog doing what he's doing and get him back on track right away. And we do that with a single word. So in, talks about the pee in the living room outside. Yeah, it, Sorry. in relation to that, we we actually just the other week published a paper. Again, uh, one of our master students, uh, Lucy China, uh, she did a master's by research and she took the data that we'd done on the, we, we got the money from DEFRA to look at shock collars versus or e-collars um, versus reward-based. 
And rather than looking at the welfare aspect, she looked at the efficiency of their training. And mm -hmm. yeah, the two just, you know, they just don't compare. Um, and, and, and that was the thing. And we, we had, you know, various controls. And yeah, there were some issues. There always are, you know, people will always trash the research. You know, it's easy to criticize any piece of research if, if you, you know, just want to look for the cherry picking. Mm -hmm. But it was just so obvious, the efficiency differences. Um, and she analyzed all the data blind. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I agree with you entirely um, about that issue that, yeah, forget, even if you forget about the welfare side, it's just about being efficient. Um, and effective. And so when you gamify training, and, and in all my workshops, I just say, right, 100 bucks says, you pick a dog for me and what to teach it, I'm gonna do it quicker than you can. Mm -hmm. So why is reward training quicker than punishment training and then why is reward training more effective than punishment training so these are the two things i just prove right now you pick a dog for yourself pick a couple for me i will get there quicker why because i only have to teach one thing because there's only one right way you have to punish the dog for an infinite number of things which will take an infinite amount of time why is it then more effective because in punishment training the danger is that the dog will learn those single instances when it can escape the punishment. Like when you're not there, the dog's at home alone, or you're naked in the shower, you know, okay. or you're on your iPhone. And the dog learns all these things when you're physically, functionally, or mentally absent. Yeah. And that is a much bigger problem, you know, to, to, to get over. Yeah. Whereas with the reward, so with punishment training, you have to punish each and every time immediately. With rewards, you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. If you reward the dog every time, they learn quickly and then the behavior drops off because now you've devalued the reward. And they say, well, I, I know they're calling me. Yeah, I know. In, in a minute, I'm sniffing this dog's bum. You know, I mean, what's the hurry? I know I'll get the treat when I get there. And so, you know, all these reinforcement schedules are too silly apart from a high powered differential reinforcement schedule that changes the algorithm with every trial. Yeah. Every trial now changes the likelihood of getting a number of different levels of reward. Yeah. And dogs. I'm, dogs I'm, are, I'm really glad you said that because as I said, that, you know, you've been at the forefront of promoting reinforcement based training, uh, not just in puppies, but across the board. But as you said, there's some people who just don't get it. And I've seen dogs, you know, completely screwed up with these continuous reinforcements. The dog is never allowed to make a decision. It's all click and treat and whatever. And and then when you put the dog in a situation, it, and it really struck me actually when I, I did a workshop with Adam McClosey and we were trying to do the do as, do as I do, you know, you yeah. demonstrate um, and then the dog follows the action. And we got a group of trainers to sort of do the preliminary. And we were in the workshop, we were going to look at the generalization, what went on and, and what had you. And there were some very good trainers there. It was interesting how many trainers dropped out. Some people said, well, we're not going to take part in this because you initially start by touching a chair um, and then the, ask the dog to do it. And the dog goes and touches the chair. And then you put a second chair there. Well, and you expect the dog to touch the other chair. You, you know, you're setting it up to fail. And, and I was thinking, well, we're getting the dog to try and think um and they, they didn't want to sort of know it must be rewarded every time and there was one trainer who's a good trainer who came to the workshop but they were all click treat click treat click treat and then when we set the dog up with something where the dog actually had to think it you could just see it start to have a meltdown what am i supposed to do i'm you know i'm waiting for the instruction from you and i just thought you know that's really sad because this person loves their dog you know they believe in using positive reinforcement but the dog's got no resilience because they just won't let it be a dog a little bit you know um and as you said it's that continuous reinforcement schedule everything you know and everything depends on a food treat um but that that, that brings me to another point because when I, I decided to call these podcasts what makes you click and somebody said after after i'd agreed the name and um, they said Oh, that sounds like it's going to be all about clicker training. I said, no, it's not. And they said, oh, well, Ian won't like it anyway either. It's about <laughs> he won't like the fact you're calling it what makes you click. Um, so I will ask you, what what are your opinions on clicker training? Just <laughs> well, I, I always um, when I talk about training, I say you have um, five basic reward based training techniques. Um, I use most of them. Okay, so from the top. The, definitely the quickest 
and most effective would be lure reward training. What if you've got an adolescent dog now that's blowing off the food because we didn't phase it out or he's never had any training, then I would use all or none reward training. I'm just going to stand and watch this dog until he does something I like and I'll say, good boy, and give him a treat. I will end up with every single dog in a sit stay looking at me because that's the most common thing to do. After a few minutes, they get bored, they sit. I say, good boy, treat. Then we have shaping with or without a clicker. Okay, um, which, uh, and, and when you look at the historical introduction of shaping to dog training, and I was right there, of course, the first ever time clickers were used to train dogs um, in a, 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 a training workshop, um, Kathleen Chin put on the workshop, no one signed up, so I promoted it. We got about 200 people because I was aware about it from the Breland's book. Martha and Kelly Breland, and um, and Marion rather, and Kelly Breland. And then of course, when Keller died, Marion married Bob Bailey, who everyone knows now. Um, And so I knew the value of clicker training and what it added to dog training at the time was, there were very few things you couldn't lure. One of them was retrieve. My luring thing for retrieve was kind of protracted, but you could shape it in one session you could try, which I'd had on my tele program in England, um, that um, we shaped this German shepherd um, to re- find and retrieve a bunch of car keys. And um, so this is what it brought to dog training because what they were still doing to dogs then for retrieve was the forced retrieve. That you show him a dumbbell and you squeeze his paw or you twist his ear with the metal collar in it or a trainer in new jersey used pliers on both ears to squeeze you know a pure negative reinforcement and as soon as you grab that dumbbell you stop the pain so it's a very potent training technique but it just goes wrong so many times and you know so then we have auto shaping this is the fourth one which means the the dog trains itself so kind of like you, you stuff a Kong with food and before you know it, within one day, the number of barks has been decimated, reduced 90% and the number of paces or steps has been reduced by 90%. Just by now, instead of feeding a dog in a bowl, feeding him from a chew toy. And then finally, you have physical prompting with rewards. Um, so you've got five basic reward training techniques, and I always talk about them, analyze them in terms of ease, which is very important because if it's not easy, owners can't do it. Yeah. Efficiency, how quick is it? Because if it ain't quick, they aren't going to do it. And then effectiveness, if it's not effective, what's the point? <laughs> We're not training the dog, but you hold that point for a moment. And then eventually, is it fun? So I analyze all these techniques. And so what's my analysis of, uh, you know, the quickest and most effective technique is low reward training. The easiest is all an unreward training because you do nothing. You just stand there. You don't give instructions. So it's kind of like shaping on steroids, but you're not shaping the behavior in successive approximations. Either the dog doesn't do it or he does. But when he does it, he does the whole behavior. He's barking or he's not. He's bouncing or he's not. He's running around or he's sitting or lying down, get it? So it's a wonderful way to teach owners who are totally frustrated and pulling their hair out how to train their dog. Clicker training is great for teaching finesse, for fine tuning stuff, and for training behaviors that can't be lured or are not in the dog's normal behavior repertoire. So you can wait for it forever, but it won't happen, okay? Um, but it requires the highest skill set and it is the slowest training technique to put behaviors on cue. And I'm a great believer when I define training, it's not just increasing or decreasing the frequency of behaviors. And so eventually they do it all the time or they never do it. To me, it's putting that reliable performance of the behavior on cue or that reliable cessation of performance on cue. It's all about on cue. So how can we quickly put it on cue? Why? So we can open communication channels so we can at least give the dog instructions it understands. You know, 
instead of back to your chair thing, I used to do this as a demo in vet colleges. I did it at Tufts. And this couple took me out, you know, the two students for lunch. So I said, can I do use you for a demo? I said, it's a little stressful, but um, I, I really want to show it. He said, yeah. So anyway, in the middle of my talk, I said, oh, could I have my demo student come up on the stage, please? And he comes up on the stage. And every student was there every year at the university because, um, was it Catherine Haupt? right was she, yeah was uh you know i was friends with her like you were and mm. we were putting on this uh, big behavior lecture so there was a line of 10 chairs on the stage and i said to this guy i said uh, sit down and he sat down and i grabbed him by the tie and said no pulled him off the chair like this i said sit down so he sits down again. And this time I grab him by the lapels and I did a judo flip over my back and he lands on the ground. His eyes go <gasps> like this. And, and it gives me that, you know, he's freaked. I said, it's okay, it's just a demo. I said, no, I like you, stand up. I'll buy you a beer afterwards, okay? And he said, well, what was all that about? I said, well, I told you to sit down, but you didn't. He says, I did. I said, yeah, but you sat on the wrong chair. I want you to sit on this chair. Yeah. He goes, so? I said, well, it's no different from a dog that you suddenly get mad when he pees on the carpet. How does he know he's peeing in the wrong place? So training is not just teaching the dog what to do, but it's where to do it, yeah. when to do it, what to do it with. And that's the thing we get annoyed about. So people, they never forgot that. You've got to mm. teach the puppy where to pee. So how do we do that? You know, da, da, da. So yeah, um, once you have two chairs, it's confusing for humans too. Mm. Um, and I can imagine the the uh, actually Pavlov had a beautiful word for this: mental collision. Oh, wow. Two things yeah. going on in the brain, you know that, um, and we don't know what to do. We want to do it, but we dare. Mental collision, isn't that a beautiful? That's, yeah, that really captures yeah. it. I think. And that's what the poor puppies go through because there they are peeing and all of a sudden the owner gets angry and grabs them and rolls them over. I mean, what's he to think? Oh, they want me to tamp my nose and the feces to push mm. it in the carpet pile or, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that's what yeah. every border collie does. Now I poop and I turn around and I go tamp, 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 tamp. That's obviously <laughs> what they want to do because they're, they're overthinking the problem, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love demos and I love human training demos because it, um, and you, you mentioned clicker training. So I, I did this routine where if you think of um, binary feedbacks we can give to a dog and in clicker training, of course, it's reward the good, ignore the bad. But before that we had um, ignore the good, punish the bad. So I would send someone out of the room at a seminar, and then I tell everyone else in the seminar, I write it on the blackboard, this person has to go over to Janet, take her beer, bring it to Ian, and put it on his desk. So that's what we train them to do. So they come through the door, and, um, and, and I always pick a guy for this, because this is gonna get scary. <laughs> and he comes through the door, I said, do it. He takes one step, and I go, no! <laughs> No, hang on, you warned me that your microphone might mute you yeah. for the next few seconds. Yes, sorry, <laughs> so I'm pausing now before I talk because uh, my mic automatically decreases the volume, but the person freezes. I said, what's wrong? Do it, do it. He says, I damn. I said, well, it's good you can tell me you damn because dogs can't. They just they freeze, just freeze. And they're just being stubborn and disobedient. Yeah. So then I will go through all, all, all sorts of... Um, training techniques you know reward the good punish the bad then i'll have a clicker trainer say right click him to do it well what happens is of course they they, they get into they click slightly off timing because you have to have perfect time for clicker training like they're walking in the right direction towards a genie to get the beer but they look at this person right when they click mm. so now the person thinks because they're human and we try and think out what are we being clicked for? They won't leave this person. You can't get them out of there. Mm. It takes forever. So I said, all right, I would train it a different way. And so I said, are you ready for my way to train now? And the guy said, take a breath, just recover because it's been stressful, isn't it? I say, Robert, that's his name. Go to Genie. 
Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Take beer. Good boy. Bring it to Ian. Good boy. Good boy. All things I would train a dog beforehand mm -hmm. so that I could, with Phoenix, communicate a single sentence. And my favorite sentence with Phoenix was, Feeny, come here, take this, go to Jamie, please. Mm -hmm. He knows, Phoenix, come, take, go to Jamie. Basic training. Please, I just add in there to be nice. So Phoenix would run outside to find Jamie, sit in front of him. We called it Malamute Mail. And it usually said something like, uh, come in now, dinner is ready, or it's mine, signed Phoenix. <laughs> because when Jamie came in slowly once, we're talking about eating the food, you know, when the dog blows us mm -hmm. off. Well, I called Jamie in for lunch and he didn't come in. So I hid the lunch. And then I put the plate on the floor and he eventually comes in. Where's lunch? That's on the floor. He says, on the floor? It's gone. I said, oh, I don't know what happened to it. And Phoenix licked the plate. I know that. And he's all going on about his lunch. I said, I called you. You didn't come. I thought you weren't hungry. You didn't appreciate it when your daddy cooks, you know? <laughs> and then I said, well, I'll see if I got something in the fridge I can prepare for you. So I get his lunch out of the Tupperware, put it on the plate, Mike, and give it to him. So from then on, it was a joke. Come here, or it's Phoenix's, counting down from 10, and he would run in. <laughs> I was never the sort of parent who's going to do the stuff that, say, some parents, and especially mothers, will do every day in, day in, day out, cooking, cleaning, washing, you know, and having it taken for granted. You take me for granted once, and I just stop working. I'm probably like the Malamute in dog training, you know? <laughs> the, no. I need some payback here. Anyway, I'm sorry. Okay, so, so actually, to be honest, you've <laughs> this is probably the most serious conversation we've ever had. <laughs> thinking about it, <laughs> you probably uh, in in that sort of uh, condensed time. But it's brilliant. It's brilliant. But okay, so let you you mentioned Malamutes, Omaha. Oh. He's got to be your favourite. Um, well, he was for the longest time. Yeah. Um, Omaha was a special dog because he was my first dog. And, um, you know, I competed with him, of course, and everyone laughed at us. You say he was your first dog, genuinely, your, your first? Yeah. Well, I, I grew up with dogs, but they yeah. were always my dad's dog yeah, or okay. my grandfather's or my uncle. And when I came to the States, so I was here for 10 years, I thought, well, I won't get a dog till I have a house. Mm -hmm. And when we bought the house, we got the puppy and then we got a bed, <laughs> Mimi and I. <laughs> you know, the puppy came first. And it was Omaha and I, I loved him. And I, I, I never have I had a dog trained so well because I trained him the whole time. And say so we competed in obedience, which taught me an awful lot about what reliability really is. And it's such a shame that competitive obedience is not as popular in the training world as it was because these days training is so sloppy. And you've got to know what healing off leash is you say heal and off you go fast slow left turn right turn and you can't talk to your dog mm. you know i personally think that's stupid if they had a level where you could praise the dog the whole time that would be a really fun activity mm. but there's nothing like the beautiful healing or a three three minute down stay you give one command you say down mm -hmm. Actually, no, you give two, you say down, and then they let you say stay, which is kind of stupid because it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because when I say down, it means immediately lie down and remain there until the next command. So the word stay is just irrelevant. But it's a shame that that's gone. So he was a lovely dog, but then a dog crept up on me. And um, her name was Zuzu. And she was crazy. I never wanted her. Um, we rescued her when she was 18 months old. She was a deer chaser, a fence jumper. And by a fence jumper, I mean, she could stand next to a six foot fence and go, boop, yeah. standing jump. She could clear six feet, uh, just mm. her. She had a butt like a quarter horse <laughs> and a pinhead, she was a Boceron. And um, she disrupted the household. All of our dogs hated her. She had an annoying play style. <laughs> Like dogs are sleeping and she's <coughs> biting in their face like this, you know. All the dogs, had, the two cats left the house and became outdoor cats that only came in to get food if we shut Zuzu up. I mean, it was terrible. And then 
one by one, our dogs died and um, I got divorced for the second time and it was uh, Zuzu and me. And we were together for two years and it's probably the most beautiful time I've ever spent with any dog. I just, I, I grew to love this dog. We did everything together. I never went anywhere without her. If I were gardening, at any time of the day, you could say, close your eyes, Ian, where's Zuzu? Oh, she's here because I'm on my computer. Or no, she's here because I'm gardening. Always on my left side, slightly behind me, sitting and watching what I do. Then as I move forward to put another plant in, she moves forward, usually sitting on the seedling I just put in the ground, you know? <laughs> um, and she was lovely and, um, we, like both my favorite dogs, actually, we made videos of them right before they died. Like Omaha's video at the end of the serious puppy training mm -hmm. was about three weeks before he died. And the same with Zuzu's video that I have on, um, um, what is it? Oh, I can't even remember the name of my own website, <laughs> Dunbar Academy. That would be my name, right? Yeah, Dunbar Academy. <laughs> Um, difficult the, one to remember I'm sure on training course you'll see the video of Suzu her last time and I just used her as the demo dog and she was very sick then you could see but she did it and she was happy and she I just wanted her to demonstrate how you train a dog to be reliable off leash and this was a deer chasing dog mm. and I'd had her off leash around deer I mean I watch her like a hawk Obviously, I'm, I'm not doing this cavalierly, but when we're outside, I really watch her. And occasionally I put her on leash now if I don't want to be attentive and watch her. So if I come to a busy street, I just put the leash on. But where I live is very quiet in the hills where, you, you know, and you, there's mm -hmm. seldom a car. So that was the the two loves of my life. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it is something when, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that, uh, you know, dogs work so hard to fit in and, and again you know this is one of the things that's really dawned on me with the work that I, I've sort of the more fundamental work that I do um, and dogs spend so much time watching their humans trying to work out what do I have to do if I can anticipate you I get an easy life you yeah. know if I know yeah. what you're about to do it becomes easy for me because I can predict you and they're really good at making those connections and picking up really subtle body language um and all they want yeah is actually to be able to predict they don't want you to be boring but they want you to be consistent so they know what's going on and yeah. then they can you know then they can fit in um and it's when the verbal commands are no longer necessary because yeah. the dog is reading you like a book and um since we've talked about being you know a, an academic and i, I quantify everything um I'll tell some dog training anecdotes as well. But one of the things about Zuzu that used to amaze me was at night we'd sit on the sofa and I'd be reading um, or, you know, watching, I watch BritBox a lot, the old British, mm. you know, programs, uh, just a hundred times better than anything on TV here, apart from the, uh, you know, the good Amazon things on Netflix things. And um, I would get up periodically to do one of two things, take a leak or refill my glass with wine. And I noticed if I got up to take a leak, she wouldn't move. If I got up with the intention, mm. so she's reading my intention here, obviously through minor body language, if I got up to refill my glass, you're she would eating. fall. <laughs> you're going to the kitchen. <laughs> because we, my glass, the way I reduce my alcohol intake was never having the bottle in the same room as the glass. So to get another glass, I have to walk downstairs to the kitchen and go to the wine rack, pull down the bottle and fill it up. So of course, the whole thing about the difference, if I go up to pee, I just go to pee, it's boring, okay? If I go to fill up my glass, I will occasionally open the fridge and have a bit of shaved Parmesan, <laughs> of which she gets a bit. And so I did these informal experiments where, and I overdid it, of course. Oh, God, I really need to pee. I'd say to myself, and I'd go up and pee. She doesn't move. Then I'd come back, and then I'd get up again and go downstairs, you know, and she would follow me, you know. 
Uh, but of course, she was just reading me like a book, and yeah. I was letting on that it, you know it was it was pure anecdote. But it, I couldn't fool her. I could not go get up to go downstairs without her first getting up to say, I, "I know where you're going. I know where you're going. You're going where the cheese is, you know, uh, and the zee peak." <laughs> and, and all she'd do is sit and look at me, and, and I would open the jar and give her some food treats. Of course. Mm. I mean, there's one thing we really forget about training that if you look at the sequence ABC antecedent behavior consequence or the, the simple one, um, the simple ones request response or response reward, it, we label these according to our viewpoint. If it's the dog labeling these, of course, it's reversed. So if we go response reward, Okay, the dog sits, so we pet it. Mm. We call the sitting a response and our petting a reward. But the dog says, I think I'm going to get them to pet me now. I can get, yeah, I've got them to, they're trained to pet me on cue. Watch this sit, make eye contact. See, they're petting me. <laughs> you know, or woof, let's see, they're opening the door now. And so now the response from the dog's view is a request. Yeah. And what we're actually looking at here is this wonderful choreography between dog and owner where each is training the other in the course of life. And we have this exquisite choreography, which is living with a dog, or to me, the epitome of it is dancing tango with your dog, mm -hmm. which Zuzu and I used to do. And we'd do it to Love Club or Revenge by Pink, because <laughs> um, I love syncopated rhythms. And we would dance and we make it up as we go. And most of the time I'm leading, but occasionally she would lead. And I just loved this. And it was actually, we'd always put on a pretty damn good performance with no training, just the two of us goofing around, but it was a good exercise. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I miss her dearly. And I, um, I haven't got another dog yet because, um, I was going back and forth between Berkeley and San Diego. Now I'm stuck in San Diego. I can't get back. Um, so I don't want to fly. Yeah. So um, I haven't been home for about five months. Oh, wow. So but it's cool. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I'll tell you one of the things, because I, when I sort of sort out this podcast, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just delve into your background and see what I can find and on your Wikipedia page. I'm just intrigued by this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's 100% reliable. It says you were a consultant on the movie Up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why did they want to consult? No disrespect. Why the hell did they want to consult with you on, on the movie Up? I mean, it's a lovely well, movie. It's, it's, I love the, the movie. movie. It's about dogs. Oh. Yeah, it had lots and lots of dogs in it. And... Um, and when they, they really take the um, cartooning of animals, you know, very, very seriously. So like when they did Ratatouille, for mm. example, they sent all of them, um, uh, the whole crew to Europe to experience uh, eating real Ratatouille in a real restaurant in, you know, so on, so on. Anyway, so I came in, sadly, they'd already chosen the breeds because I would never have had Alpha as a Doberman. I would have picked a Shih Tzu or a Chihuahua or something. You know, let's be realistic. You'd have the most puny dog as the... <laughs> yeah. And then they had a lot of dogs that looked like Pit Mastiff Cross, mm -hmm. which, you know, and these were the bad guys. Um, so anyway, I was brought in to go over facial expressions and uh, so body language, but especially the micro facial expressions like a single eyebrow rise or eyebrow up, down, what have you. So first they came to my house and then videoed my dogs, Phoenix and Ashby. And then I lectured on stage at Pixar. And that's when, get this, I did this demo, which now the director of Up, Doctor, he is now saying he came up with this. So I'm walking on the stage saying, here's what happens to a dog when you walk him along the street. The input that goes into his brain. Every step you take, a zillion pieces of information go into the dog's brain and he's responding to them. And it sort of goes like this. So, oh, I think a cat's looking at cats. Like, oh, there's a McDonald's wrapper over there. Like, oh, that dog's round on the other block. I hope he doesn't come down here. We really don't like that dog. Oh, that is good. A bit of cat poo. Squirrels! You know, so I did this on the stage and it's filmed. 
And then he said he came up with the squirrels routine. No, that was my, I'm sorry, that was mine. I did it on the stage at Pixar. And if you look at the Blu-ray version, you can actually see the videos of my lecture and the videos of my dogs as they then morph into the cartoon characters. Oh, wow. So I would wa they were watching my dogs play. I say, you see that sudden movement, that electric, the dogs are still. And then they go, Doo! that means they're suddenly going to explode in play any second. Or you see the eyebrow go up, you know, shaking it off. He's a little worried about the play now. So he's shaking it off and then they'll go into play bow and atmosphere cue, you know. And um, so it was a it was a great experience. Well, I'm going to go and get the Blu-ray version of Up now. Um, yeah, <laughs> if, that, if that's there, I'll be disappointed if it's not. <laughs> yeah. And then you'll see um, all the extra stuff. You'll see Ashby and Phoenix and and oh. the, the lecturing on the stage. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Right. So one of the things we haven't talked about uh, directly is also. I mean, we talked about briefly about you, um, Sirius and. Well, you didn't actually, I'm not sure if you answered the question, how you, you know, what made you switch from the, or realize that, you know, leaving dogs till they're six months old, we need to be training them much earlier. You know, that's, you know, that was a, that's a big step. Um, <clears throat> well, it, it's a, a purely a personal um, life change that um, I, I, uh, I got interested in dog training very early on doing the research because I was asked to give a um, 10 week course on dog behavior at the university extension. And I really loved it because everyone was interested in what I had to say, which is very different when you're an academic <laughs> and lecturing and, you know, you know, is this on the midterm? Do we need to know this bit? You know, that sort of question. Um, anyway, so um, I, left the research because um, I, I was about to get married and Mimi as a test I knew she had been offered professorship in Toronto and San Diego so I thought well, that's cool so I said to her I'll go wherever you go it's important for you to follow your career I'm happy with what I've done the 10 years of research has really fulfilled me I'm happy to do something else I don't know what um, but so you follow yours. I didn't know she'd been offered a job at Nebraska, <laughs> Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. There was, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. We would drive 70 miles to eat. There were no palatable restaurants in the town, you know. Um, and, and one night we drove 240 miles to Kansas City for a meal. It, it was, oh God, it was terrible. So we did that. Then um, we came back. And I became a house husband. So when we were in Nebraska, I was a peripatetic lecturer. I was in my car. I drove to every uh, contiguous state giving doggy lectures. And I loved it. I wrote a book, you know. Then we came back to Berkeley and <laughs> um, we bought a house. And so I renovated the house, did everything, rewired it, replumbed it with copper, um, put in a new kitchen, massive kitchen. It's where my son lives now. So, you know, put in three quarter inch oak floorboards. That was a back breaking job. Anyway, when I finished, and I loved it. She went out to work every day and I stayed at home doing this thing. Um, we had an intervention. She said, let's go away for a couple of days. So we went to Bolinas um, on the coast where they filmed, Hitchcock filmed the birds. And she says to me, she got very serious. I thought, oh God, what's going on? What have I done wrong? And she says, Ian, I bought you a cigar. I want you to go out to that rock and sit in the surf, smoke the cigar and not come back until you can explain to me how you're going to bring money into this relationship. And I thought, <laughs> oh no, it's ended. You know, I love being a house husband because we had Jamie then. I love I loved it being at home. Anyway, so I went out, I sat on the rock and honestly, it was as quick as this. I lit the cigar. I thought, right, obviously it's got to do with dogs. Dog behavior, changing dog behavior. I thought, I know I'm going to teach puppy classes. So I walked back in and I'm not four minutes had gone by. I said to Mimi, I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. Said what? So I'm going to start a puppy school. 
I'm going to call it Sirius after the brightest star in the heavens, Sirius. And I'm going to teach puppy classes. And she looks at me, this sort of withering look, says like, you got three doctorates and you're going to teach puppy classes. I said, yeah, it'll be fun. So I went back, finished my cigar, and I came back to Berkeley. Uh, I went round to see about 10 vet clinics, told them what I was going to do. I said, these are all about changing the puppy's temperament, molding it so the puppy has lots of confidence around people and is easy to handle. Because I knew this was the most common question vets had. How the hell do we work with an adult dog? And it just took, I had 12 puppets in my first class. It became an instant hit and then a cash cow. As I got a second trainer, a third trainer, then ended up with 20 trainers and over 20 branches. And it was an enormous company, which we shut down on March the 13th. Bam. We had to refund 500 people in training. We shut down 20 branches. Um, but where we were lucky, and, and this is worth talking about, um, all in my career, I've changed the media. It used to be, you know, I had to give a seminar, I had to be invited to give a seminar. You had to be asked by a publisher to write a book or make a DVD. And every time I gave seminars, I did the math, I got ripped off. There'd be a hundred people paying 50 bucks each, yet I only get a hundred bucks for the seminar. Do the math, Ian. So I started my own seminar company, my own book publishing company, my own video company and so on. And then our own websites and, uh, and what have you. And gradually we digitized everything. And so when we suddenly had to shut down Sirius, I was worried I've got um, a payroll of about 25 people. How the hell do I keep these people on payroll? Well, the first thing that happened is the three of us, the directors, took nothing. We reduced our salaries to zero. Uh, then next comes the office staff, keep them on. But within one month, because we are now very sophisticated in terms of digitizing information, our websites, first Dog Star Daily, that uh, was our first shop, then Dunbar Academy, which is basically my digitized brain. My son had went to every seminar I gave and filmed it, put it up there. The amount of information on it was colossal, but we knew the technique. Within less than one month, Kelly had serious puppy training online. And uh, we are now at about, we're running at the same net as we did, were in February, because of course the expenses are less, there's no rental, you know. Um, but we're at about 60% of capacity of what we were. But what paid for everything, DunbarAcademy.com. It went crazy. And Jamie runs this. He's increased the number of subscribers by 500%. And that's now our bread and butter income that pays for everything we do. So all the nonprofit stuff we do, so like dogstardaily.com is totally free. Mm. A lot of Dunbar Academy is free. It's because we run good for-profit corporations. Used to be serious. Well, that just floundered. Bam, overnight. It was scary because I was worried about my employees and we've managed to keep everyone on payroll. Wow. Uh, we do have a couple who have voluntarily furloughed themselves to take UI, but they will come back as soon as the UI, the unemployment insurance finishes. Um, and then, so we've kept everyone on board, but it was only because we were doing things like you and I are doing now. If it were made for something, because the web up there, it's a brain cancer. 99.9% .9 up there in the cloud is just bullshit that's going to erode your brain and suck the lifeblood out of you. Mindless rubbish you know, misinformation, but that 0.1% is pure gold. It's called education. Yeah. And it's the sort of stuff that you're doing that I like to think I'm doing. Then now it's, it's available for anyone who wants it. And, and you can now, with all these free universities starting up, you can take university courses on pretty much any subject. They have these lovely one day universities 
and they have like 30 different speakers, best of the best in the world. It kind of doing like a TED talk, mm. but for an hour each. Um, okay. And so it, it's been a very interesting journey and, and it's very, I feel cool that we were always at the crest of the wave in terms of technology. You know, it's like, I, I when I typeset the first book, this was before we had Wussigig. <laughs> it was all dot commands. And you had to send it over the telephone at a speed where to transmit my behavior booklets, it would take all night long to just send a 48 page booklet for typesetting. Then I'd have to walk to the campus to pick it up. You know, we were there, um, the video, Serious Puppy Training was the very first dog training video to hit the market. So we were always right at the beginning, you know, and um, putting on our, you know, seminars, filming them, putting them up for free. Um, no one would, everyone was like, oh no, very protective. I filmed this, you're gonna have to pay to look at it. We offer so much for free thinking, you know, I'm sorry, I've got a lot to say. Hmm. I could, you, you know, we could go on chatting together like we're doing when you were staying with the boys and we stayed up drinking away <laughs> and talking and talking and talking and talking. And it wasn't just bullshit. We were talking about some serious topics, you know, in addition just to saying we couldn't remember them in the morning. <laughs> we yeah. When your son says, what were you talking about? I don't know. Something <laughs> was really important though. Um, I'm sure it changed our behavior without us yeah. realizing. <laughs> So no, it came back yeah. as we yeah. went. So we remember all day long, we were trying to think, what were we talking about? And bit by bit, it yeah. came back and we had good mm. recall once we had the clue. Yeah, no, you know. get, get the prompt in. No, it's, um, it's, it's lovely to hear you say that because yeah, it is, it's a difficult one. It, and I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. How do you guide people towards the really good stuff on the web? Um, and it, it's, it's interesting because my two boys there, sort of two and a half years apart and Stefan the oldest one I remember when he was doing his um history O level he he was taught in a um in when they change education and, and he was given an assignment about the gunpowder plot uh, which is mm -hmm. if people are obviously um if, if, uh, people in the states it's when a, a group of catholics try to blow up our parliament um mm -hmm. and uh, there's a moral there I'm sure so we burn it <laughs> once a year in effigy. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, um, so basically, his uh, his homework was right. Here are sort of three pieces of information. One is a confession extracted out of uh, under torture. One is a report to the papacy, and one is an eyewitness account at the time, a report to the king, or something like that. So. There are these three resources. What do you think actually happened in this situation? Yeah, yeah. And I, I looked at this and I thought, this is brilliant. These are exactly the skills that kids yeah. need nowadays with the internet. They've got to be able to work out what's crap, what's not. Yes. And then, unfortunately, by the time Thomas did his GCSE, somebody in the government had said, they don't know who was on the throne in 1667. That's terrible. You know, they've got all their heads filled with this, all this bubbly stuff. And they've got to know, you know, which order the kings came in. And I just said, oh, Would that my be a God. Charles? I'm trying Sorry? to think myself who was on the throne. I had no idea. I didn't do. I would I, say I, a Charles. I'd go for a Charles. Yeah, probably. Um, so Thomas had to learn dates. This is what happened. Da, da, da. And I just thought that is such a shame because it's just because, you know, that's what Google's for. That will tell you who's on the throne on 1667 and you won't have an argument over it. You know, we've no, got I, that information. But I, I daren't now because we're, <laughs> I'm meant to be paying attention. I can't multitask. <laughs> yeah, I know that's what Google's for. Um, but, you know, that's why we have mobile phones. And as Tom said, you know, you might realise mobile phones. There wasn't a mobile phone 15 years ago, you know, no. of, a, a, a smartphone. And you think, geez, you know, but that can carry so much extra information i think it was socrates bemoaned when language uh, written language came along because he said oh we'll lose those certain skills it allows us our brain to concentrate on other things and it's a real shame that you know i think that they went back to that traditional now this whole covid thing has just thrown universities into all sorts of turmoil because you know basically for next term i've got to get all my teaching so that i can deliver it either face to face, but also distance learning. So if we go into shutdown, the students aren't going to be disadvantaged, but we've got to have elements in what they're calling blended learning. 
and it has forced me to rethink everything that the way that I do and what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but also using the quality resources, but just trying to get people to, you know, where is their quality stuff now? Okay, in dog training, we can put them to your website. <laughs> That's a good starting point, certainly. Um, but, you know, I think, I do think, you know, and I, one of the things that um, I really appreciated as a student was, um, it was, and I can't remember who it was, who said it to me but you know just go and see practice with as many different dog trainers as possible because you'll always learn something even if it's you don't want to do it that way you know and if people need that exposure but again this whole idea that sort of well you don't agree with me i'm going to unfriend you i don't want to hear from you it is so unhealthy you know you ha and this is this is sort of what i wanted out of these conversations is they're conversations um and um you know and you know we don't know everything uh, we can have opinions and we can discuss ideas and we can try and move forward and think okay you know what is it we need to know or what's the best way to actually proceed but everybody wants sort of as you said what's going to be on the exam tell me what's going to be on the exam because i need to pass the exam now fortunately on the master's program we run like you say you know everybody on that master's program wants to do behavior modification so they're an absolute joy to to work with um but you know, it's it's really difficult, I think, with trying to just get, yeah, making the best of what is out there. As you say, there's some absolute sort of gold dust there as well. But so much of it is is unhealthy. But anyway, that's that's got to be. And I think, you know, I look on it as a um, this is a great opportunity for your students to create gold dust by doing very simple studies on dog training so let's say it's um time and trials to criterion let's just you know yeah. i'll um design some studies right now um we do either have a class of 12 dogs or we have one dog at a time we have a 50 minute training session with them we test them beforehand and at the end so it's test train test using each dog as its own control we're going to graph it out in histograms. So see if there are daylight between the two populations. Um, I should but... warn, actually, I'm going to jump in at this point because I've got somebody who is a really good trainer who's contacted me who wants to do a PhD with me. And I've said, we're going to do something on training. So you might end up being co-author or co-supervisor on this student. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd, I'd love to because the nitty gritty is, you know, time and trials to criterion what is the quickest most effective way to teach to heal off leash to one minute sit stay three minute down stay uh, position changes sit down sit stand down stand or randomize three positions which is six different position changes um and and then you know absolutely quantifying them mm. and when i did you know i've been trying to get people to do this for years i mean for 10 years it never happened and with the apdt i um I, I said we've got to have a science tract because it's so boring it's always the same the same speakers talking about the same stuff and but there's no demonstrations it's talk 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 what we should see is video of training 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 with proof that this dog's behavior was changed due to this training and I said, it's the easiest thing and the most worthwhile thing to do experiments on. But as soon as we get into, and it's why I started the APDT Foundation, to give money prizes for research done. Instead, what they're doing is they're giving grants to institutions beforehand. I didn't want that. I wanted training done by dog trainers. They've done the study. They have a poster board and the winning poster board gets 5,000 bucks, let's say. Mm. But anyway, it's still up and running, the APDT Foundation. But um, we, we've never got this going. It yeah, it's, always, a, it's a real shame. They always have to go into researching shelters or cognition. Mm. You'll never get a p-value with cognition. I mean, let's be realistic. It's tough. But it, it's interesting <laughs> because, you know, um, and I, this might sound a bit strange because, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, I'm starting to think about my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> how much do I actually? Yeah, how much do I? Well, I'm getting near to mid fifties now, and I'm thinking, 
how much, you know, how much do I need to actually live on? And what are the things I actually want to do? And yeah, ex exactly. And th these are some of the things sort of trying to reach out. And one of the things I would like to, to, to do, and this is typical me, now I go and say something, and I think like, okay, now it's, <laughs> now I'm committed to doing it. It's like, oh, let's do a podcast. <laughs> Thomas, yeah. Great idea. Right. Okay. How the hell do you do a podcast? I mean, it's this easy. You just do this. So, but, um, yeah, trying to get networks of trainers who will, yeah, just record what they're doing. Um, I'm trying to do the same with um, people dealing with problem behavior in order to try and do some trials. But and it just reminds me that, uh, you know, people can be very intimidated by research. And um, I did one of those sort of really weird things that um, uh, I found out that somebody that had been to a couple of my talks, she seemed to like what I do. And she got a puppy and she called it Professor Spaniel Mills. I thought, <laughs> I thought there we go. Now that's, that, that beats the PhD, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and I saw her at one of the meetings and, uh, and I said, I've heard that you've done this. And she was quite embarrassed. And she said, oh, do you mind? I said, no, I think it's really cool. I said, I just want a copy of its Kennel Club registrations. I've got it on my wall at work. Um, this, this beautiful little Spaniel. Um, and she was doing an online course. And, and I said, well, if you want some help, I'll do it. And this is the thing, you know, she was trained and she's saying, well, you know, I'm not a great scientist. And uh, I'm, again, I'll, I'll give her name, Greta Ford. Um, I'll have to tell her to go and listen to this one. Um, and, you know, she, she was a trainer. And I said, look, science isn't difficult. You know, all it is, is about a good experiment. It's about having a simple question that can be answered with data. And we've done the stuff, you know, on dogs, um, recognition of emotion in people and angry faces versus happy faces and there was all the stuff on pointing as well and we said well you know everybody who the, the and going back to your cognition work you know when they do the pointing experiments you know you point in one direction and then the food is in the other direction the dog follows the point but the person has got you know as they say ha has a neutral face and this is again the thing that i struggle with what the heck is a neutral face to a dog there isn't such a thing it's weird you know a neutral face is that that you're either happy or you're angry with your dog, you know? Um, and so we did this pointing with neutral, happy and angry and the head turned. So we, we pointed in one direction and you looked in the other direction. And the question was, you know, how did it actually affect? And, you know, and because she was a dog trainer, she went off and she got 63 dogs trained, you know, in, in about three weeks time. And I said, right, okay, we're going to write this up and whatever. And we got the paper, the publication. Yeah. I've now got the photo, not only of her puppy, but also her puppy with its paper publication. <laughs> and I think, you know, trainers can do so much. They could do so much to just help move the field on. And they that's could. one of the things I'd like to try and do is, as I said, if I, if I do take partial retirement or whatever in the next few years, I don't know. Um, yeah, just try and convince people that, research isn't difficult and whatever you just have to be able to follow the instructions if you know if you can bake a cake you know you could you can do science it's really not difficult but yeah i think when you ask the you know the initial question and uh, so if we have to define asking a question for people it's a, usually a single sentence that begins with a word you know uh, when what how when or or, or why um, the neat thing about dog training, um, you know, because a lot of science questions would be uh, like, start with the word does, does this happen or what have you in dog training, we know it's going to happen. So every research question for a study starts with the word, how, how much can I improve a sit stay in 50 minutes? How? much can I improve a recall? Because we know the behavior change is going to be colossal. So the question is, how much is the change going to be? You know? So mm. like it recalls. I love it. A dog park recall. I love going in the dog park with an absolutely untrained dog and uh, have the owner or myself ask it to come, say, 20 times in a row. And so we get that on tape and then we train a perfect dog park recall on the dog. Once we have uh, have proof, it doesn't know it. And it's just a fascinating technique, but it works with 95% you know, of dogs in one session when you do it right. Yeah. And um, 
And I actually did it on TV, which, oh God, I should put that off my website. Have it on, yeah, I forgot that. It was one of the, I was in Japan. In Japan, I'm so well known, it's amazing. You know, people in the States barely know me unless they're in the doggy world. They still know me, older people from England because of the telly program, but in Japan, I was on the most popular TV program ever recorded in Japan. And my fans include the Emperor, you know, last time I was there. This is a real connection because they podcast with Kathy. She grew up riding the Emperor's horses because her father was based there. Yeah. So so, so I'm going to have to find out from the hearts what their connection with the Emperor. Was he a veterinarian, was he then? No, he was in the army. Ah, um, so they yeah. were over there, you know, after the surrender. Because I used to know the old emperors. Well, I still know the old emperors, veterinarians. Yeah. That's how I got to knew the, you know, the present. Or the, uh, used to be the prince and princess, now the present mm. emperor. Anyway, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, you were uh, oh, yes, no, the most TV popular TV program in Japan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, was, uh, it wasn't me. It was um, the producer and the host. The hosts were a pop group called Tokyo. So they were all um, young, handsome guys, but they came up with this idea of a premise for a Christmas show, two hour Christmas show on dog training with me as the dog trainer and the various band members being my assistants. So they all wore like jumpsuits saying Dunbar dog training on, you know, and the one of them is an amazing guy. He had the ability of taking any dog and bringing out the worst in it. Every, everything he did with animals was wrong, you know? Like he could get the most stable dog to growl at him or a, a, a peaceful old Bernese to pull him along the street on his back. So it was great. He would go in and get the bad footage. Then I would come in and solve it. And I remember we went to this place, a Doberman, a beautiful apartment, it was huge, you know, obviously very rich people. It's a Russian model and an IT person I think with the, the couple they had a baby the dog had destroyed it so I go in and they say well if we tried this and I had a Kong and, and stuff the Kong the dog's watching me so he ends up sit staying after attempting to steal it a few times I said excuse me so he's sitting and watching me and I give him the Kong and he lies down and chews it I said well that's it so we kind of wrap early because we got, I mean, how long can you film a dog lying down chewing a Kong, you know, and I'd really stuffed it with a lot of <laughs> into that, pretty sneaky. So then they said, well, let's wrap and um, get together tomorrow for the park. So I said, okay, I was happy to be let off. So I said, what time is it tomorrow? They said, six o'clock. I'm like, oh, no. I mean, I just don't do mornings. By mornings, I mean anything before noon, you know, I, I, I hate it. Thank you so, for getting up early today then. Yeah, but I thought, oh, well, it'll be this dome and a dog park. And most Japanese dog parks are the size of, you know, dining room tables. I get there, it's about two acres, this park, long and thin. I'm like, oh. So I say to them, well, how many times have you been to the park? And they said, well, never. I said, well, how many times has the dog been off leash? They said, oh, never. And they want me to train this two-year-old Doberman in the park. So we did this, um, the dog park recall routine. And um, we let him off leash and we try and catch him. It's, it's, it's so, the footage is lovely. She's like tossing the baby like a rugby football to the guy as she dives after it. She's a real actress, uh, you know, the Russian model. And then we watch this dog and he's running the length of the park, it was several hundred yards, it's long and thin. He looked like a gazelle, like doing, 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 <laughs> I'm free, I'm free. He's obviously never been free. So I said, right, I'm gonna take a break and go find coffee. And actually, I wanted coffee in the toilet. You know, it's very early in the morning. And if someone's here watching the dogs, you know, the camera crew, they said, what do you mean you leave? I said, well, nothing's going to happen for half an hour. If you want to film me trying to catch this dog, you can do that, but I'm not going to do it. You can film the owners trying to catch the dog, but they won't. <laughs> so I go and get coffee and go to the bathroom. And, and I come back and say, right, let's start training. So now the dog's still flying by like this, you know. So I'm trying to get his attention. I say, yo, Dobie, Dobie, and tossing a treat. Well, he's oblivious. But this little beagle sees it. And he sees this treat. Being a beagle, he's watching trajectory. Land comes up, sniffs, finds it, then looks up at me and trots over. So I thought, well, I'm bored. I start training the beagle, right? You know, come, sit, 
good boy, stay, down, sit, roll over, good boy. And the Doberman runs by and he sees this out the corner of his eye because I'm making a big deal. Good boy, have a treat. Why don't you have whatever his name was, Saxon's treat. I keep saying it. <laughs> well, he's looking at me like this. And that's it, we've got him now. So he comes in and as soon as he, and the technique is, as soon as they come in, you don't make any grabs. You wrap them around your body so they lean against your side with his collar, feed a treat, another treat, another treat. Then you grab the collar and you say, gotcha, treat, 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 and you run away. Mm. And with most dogs, they run after you. Yeah. Then you stand still and you've done it. So now, because the secret is come here, take the collar, give a treat, go play. Mm. You've got to give them the confidence to go play. So that was the first time I did it. But anyway, quantifying that, yeah, it's wonderful. And, and I want to have a trainer who does it and says, here's what I did to these 12 dogs, sit stays and down stays in 40 minutes each. Here's what I did. Look at the two histograms. Yeah, of course, it's statistically reliable. Mm. There's daylight. Mm. The intraocular traumatic test between the two populations, beautiful inverted bell curves. And um, so there you go. Can anyone do better? Yeah. No, I think yes. I, there's so and, and, much. And here's the point, because some can. Most people will look at this and think, oh, my word, how did they do that? I want to know what they did. And some people will say, I'm going to give that a go. And they produce better results. So who do we want to listen to now? Do you get it? Mm, yeah. We would then know who we want to listen to to learn how to train a dog. It's so easy, but no one has done it. And I did this study years ago. I'm going to republish it online for people to look at how easy it is. And I want other people to do it. Because I, I had several mistakes mm. in, in the study. Like one stupid, this was a puppy class. Week one, we did the test. Week six, we did the test. But in the cumulative score, I had handling. Well, everything improves. You see, handling will get worse. As it happened, our handling score say, stayed the same. But that was a big part of the score hmm. that stayed the same. Puppies are easy to handle, or we maintained that ease to handle hmm. in adult dogs. And that was stupid. It should have been just on recalls, healing, off take it, thank you, sit, stay, down, stay, stand, stay, and position changes. And the first student to do this, though, sadly, you've come into the end of a long career, Danny. You're in the sunset years <laughs> now of your career. It, you're too old to do this. But for a student, the first student to produce studies on dog training, Will become so famous they will be lecturing all over the world at the various apdts in australia in japan in france and in, in uh, the us in canada you know all so of which this, this, this is, and uh, they'll become famous yeah so this was part of the idea behind this student and i said he wants to do it self-funding and hopefully he still wants to do it but you never know um and i said to him you know one of the issues is all the stuff we do on learning theory and stuff like that is based on rats kept in isolation in boxes. But yeah. There's no distractions that, you know, the average training class has got half a dozen other dogs there or more. And we know, you know, there's some really nice literature on dog sensitivity to reward inequity. So, you know, you train a dog with one treat and, um, you know, the dog learns the task. You train another dog with three treats, then you bring them together. And guess what? The dog who gets one treat suddenly says, stuff that I'm not going to do this anymore if he's getting three treats and you know not nobody's looked at any of this stuff mm -hmm. in, in a training context and you just think well, this is what's going on in every training class and we really need to do it so yeah and I said to him you know if, if you do this you you will you know he's a good trainer and I hope he still wants to do it um um because yeah I, I agree with you I think this is this is just it's the right time now and as you say with the media being able to, you'll be recording all your trials anyway, because you'll be measuring them. You, you'll be able to put everything out there for everybody. Yeah, um, and even better, let me give you another tip. You got a really good student. If we took horses, and horses are easy to find, and they're usually on their own. One horse in a stable, poor thing, one horse outside. We're only gonna teach it three things. 
lure reward training. Come when called. Easy. One session is probably six trials because horses learn in fewer trials than border collies. They learn so quickly, lure reward training. Come when called to go to and voluntarily walk in a horse box yeah. and to lie down on cue. So we don't have to cast them with ropes just mm. to look at their underbelly. Trainer does that, they will become one of the most important horse people in the world. And think about it. The, and the two things there are easy. So the recall simple for a dog trainer to teach a horse to come and go to a horse box easy for a dog trainer to teach a horse the lie down luring it down needs a little thought so you need to video a horse lying down and think how do we lure this and my tip would be you need to make a little bridge out of hay bales so you can put your hand underneath to bring the horse's head in right like under the knee and he will kneel down first and then what mm. you do is when he's kneeled push the lure into him and the butt collapses. Mm. So the first person to do this with horses, and, and I mean, they're going to make millions of dollars. <laughs> but no, but, when you look at the number of racing horses that can't even walk to a starting gate I without know. freaking out, it is, if you want to see training still in the Neolithic age, it's horses. You know, most dog trainers, yeah, as you say, some people still use shock collars or metal collars or jerk or what have you. But by and large, it's made huge steps. Horse training hasn't. We have small groups who are doing join up, which, of course, is negative reinforcement. Yep. You think Absolutely. about it. Yeah, no. It's, I, I, you know, when, I, when I explain the ear pinch, they go, no. I say, well, it's negative reinforcement. Yeah, torture. When you do what I want, I'll stop hurting you. And, of course, it's psychological negative reinforcement. But given the, the end results, it's cool. It's fine. Because so, now the horse isn't scared of people and we have a relationship. So it, it's one trial of stress. But, you know, when we look, there's just small groups of people using really slow, inefficient, ineffective techniques. And what we need is lure reward training in horses, training them up quickly, doing the basics. Because come here is the acid test of does that horse like you? Yeah, with any animal. absolutely and I, I agree entirely and it's it's time for my confession then because when i first moved into academia um i was actually employed they had set up the first degree in equine science in the uk and they were told they needed two members of staff they needed a vet to teach the equine health and somebody to teach the equine behavior and the guy in charge said well i'll get a vet with an interest in behavior and it this, this advert appeared in the vet record for a vet with an interest in behavior and I was in uh, I was in practice and I thought well that looks good I'll go with it um and I sort of turned up for interview and I mean I've always been around um dogs as I grew up I'd learned to ride but you know never been a great rider and I like horses they more of a problem with some of the horse owners I mean some of them are brilliant some of them are absolute nightmares but anyway they they get offered me the job and so I have to deliver this course in equine behavior and I can say it because I don't teach the course anymore. Um, I ended up doing my PhD in horse behavior. And I, I was thinking, well, what am I going to teach them? I thought, well, I had one lecture at university on horse behavior. That was by Sid Ricketts. Um, and thinking, right, OK, well, I've dug out those notes. That's not going to not gonna last 12 weeks. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, I'll just sort of teach them and sort of how you train a dog. But I'll put the word horse in front of it. Yeah. And and the students were sort of, wow, this is sort of, this is really different, you know. And and after a few years, I wrote up my notes into the book Equine Behavior, and to my amazement, you know, it was really well received. And people said, oh wow, this is radical. And I was thinking, what do you mean it's radical? This is this is just the way you train a dog, but it's a horse. And yeah, people really. I mean, I, I never built on it any further. And this is why I'm in academia and not in business. Um, I'm not good at. Uh, commercializing those things but um but yeah i agree with you entirely it's absolutely you know, the the basic stuff that we do with dogs you can just apply with horses and i was i was chatting with somebody actually the other day and they were trained the horse and i said well why didn't you just train the horse um 
you know, to load on a verbal command into the lorry. And they're sort of, oh, yeah. well, you know, owners aren't, owners are used to the negative reinforcement. And she's a good trainer and I'm sure she would no, you know, it, do, it, do it well. It, it, very, no, I, I got to stop you right there. Very few owners are doing negative reinforcement. They do not have the skill. They do yeah, not have well, the timing. They yeah. are just doing what they think is punishment or positive yeah. reinforcement, but it ain't because it's not solving the problem. You see, if it was solving, the, by definition, if punishment was solving the problem, you wouldn't be punishing anymore. Mm, but that yeah. ain't the case. They do it every day. So therefore, if it's not punishment, what is it? Well, it's just downright abuse. Yeah. When we look at the transference of dog techniques to horses, it's interesting to see what they do, because remember the five reward-based mm. training techniques I, I, I mentioned, low reward training, all and unreward training, shaping, auto shaping, and prompting with rewards. Well, all they do is prompting with rewards, and it's all disguised with this prey behavior, predatory behavior, mm. push here, look here, and but it's basically prompting with rewards, then shaping got into horses. We had a number of people who were clicker training, mm. but the other three, They've never used auto shaping. Oh my God, every horse in a stable needs some kind of auto shaping toy, you know, so he doesn't pace or crib bite or wind suck or what have you, the equivalent of stuffing Kongs. And then when we train them, every horse needs to be trained first by all in a reward training and then lure reward training and we speed things up. And in one session, you can, I, I tell you, I, I got a horse, well, I started riding when I was at vet college because I hated horses. I was scared of them. So I took riding classes. And I kind of liked the riding. Never very good at it. But I continued riding in California. They had this lovely horse um, that used to, anyone who got on it, it threw them off. Uh, you went in the stable, it tried to kick you out the stable. You know, like if you were a horsey person who was up on your high horse, they would send you in to put a halter on it in the stable and you would come out quickly. So I kind of like this horse because she, number one, she was cool with me because I treated her like a biting dog and she would come to me and lower her head because I taught her head up head down, head up. and what does head down mean? I'm okay with you. Then I put the rope round her neck, let her go, come again. So then I taught her to come in the stable, lower the head, put her on, and we became quite friends. And I liked her because she had an easy trot. <laughs> and I'm a crappy rider, okay? So eventually they were gonna get rid of her um, because she just had too many people off. And so I thought, well, I, I, I'll buy her. So I bought her, I renamed her Pudding, they called her Black Beauty, but she looked like a black pudding, essentially. She <laughs> was a blob. So, and I trained her on the floor, four on the floor. I put her on leash and I taught her forward, halt, forward, halt, or forward, whoa, forward, whoa. Then I went through the gears and on the ground, I could only do the first three, you know, walk, um, trot, canter. We did it all on the ground with grass. I went out, she saw this grass. She's trying to get out through the fence. I hopped over the fence, picked all the grass, put it in a bag. I had her, lure water. I could not believe how quickly she learned. Then I did hustle and steady. Then I, uh, I trained in, classically trained in a reward spot on the right side of her neck. Why? Because everyone approaches horses on the left-hand side, which I call the danger side. That's where you're going to get bitten or kicked. So I approached on the left, patted her, treat, pat, treat, pat, treat. So now I can do it from the saddle. And I'm not kidding, the next day I got on the horse, I said, pudding, walk, <laughs> and she walks. And so I patted her on the neck, pudding, you know, trot. Cause I hadn't got the leg aids. I just couldn't do it. I would squeeze and I'd pull a muscle in my groin and try to get her to do all this stuff. But now I just chatted to her and I concentrated on my style. So I looked really good, which is unverbal commands. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind how quickly she learned this, quicker than any breed of dog I'd ever worked with. And she got it. I, I'm, I'm walking alongside her, I remember, and I said, uh, hustle, steady, you know, hustle, I speed up, steady, I slow down. She got that in an instant with the, with the grass rewards. So no, it's a gold mine out there because they're only using physical prompting with rewards 
they're only using which is all the horsey horse whispering stuff mm -hmm. basically just re uh, mastered with fancy names like join up and horse logic and you know horse savvy but it's basically physical prompting with rewards um, but what they need is auto shaping for loneliness in the paddock and stable and then all in on reward training and lure reward training and you got a trained horse i've got to ask you have you got a funny rattlesnake in the background with your dog playing with a toy there's this sort of ringing that i get every now and again it's as oh, if maybe it's... I was playing with my glasses. Oh no, it's as if it's it's like a a toy with a little bell in it. Oh no, there's someone using a uh, pneumatic drill over there. Oh it yeah, comes through. it comes through like a little, uh, as, as if the dog was dropping this toy. <laughs> so just so pe if people. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. yeah, it's really annoying. I mean, That's I okay. can pick up and move, but we've been going for nearly. Uh, let's yeah. go for two hours. Yeah, good lord, two hours, one hour. Yeah, two hours. Mm -hmm. We've been going. Um, so, mm -hmm. not yet, nearly. Yeah. Um, it says, yeah, it's probably getting on for two I hours. Did one with Beverly Cuddy? It went on for two and a half hours. Just do you want? The other... I mean, do you want to keep going, or do you want to do another one? Yeah, let's do another you... ten minutes. It's good. Yeah. We can always. Now that you see how easy this is, we can come and do this anytime. Yeah, I might. I'll take you up on that. I'm you can do not... it. Early in the morning for you, 8 a.m. for you, midnight for me, and I can be drinking red wine. Instead, oh. I, in fact, I've run out of coffee. Yeah, I don't know why. Said I've got my white wine tonight. Yeah, so, no, anyway, no. cheers. Lucky you. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah I, I, can, I can do whatever. So, uh, training in dogs, training in horses, studies, 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 mm. have all come out from Lincoln now. So, I, it's, it's interesting, though, because, as I said, with the... The horse stuff it just doesn't seem to have taken off and obviously people like paul mcgreevy have been trying to change the the sort of um get people out of the mindset but whatever reason i mean maybe it just needs a really good tv show or you know as you say people need to see it this is well, that's it rather than the studies they need to see it and no the study here's here's my view of studies dog training study horse training study everything is videoed and what people see is the results and the 50 minute video of you working with the horse with no editing. Yeah. That's what's missing in the world of animals, real training by real trainers, videos online. And then owners watch this and think, I don't believe that. See what they did with that horse in just 50 minutes or that dog. And that's what's missing. Everyone's talking about it and the amount of bullshit just drives you around the twist. Mm. And with some people, it is obvious to me, they have never trained a dog in their life. But there they are lecturing around the world about dog training. Mm. What? I, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I remember going to one of the, um, I think it was a Pirelli demonstration, and the guy was saying, well, you do this X number of times. And I said, why do you do it so many times? He said, oh, well, because that's what, the way you do it. And I was thinking, no, you do it until the horse's behavior has changed. <laughs> you know, yeah. And it's just sort of, People like having rules. And this, this is the thing I, I actually struggle with, you know. Um, people like packages. They like things that are, yeah, recipe cards and things like that. And and I'm sort of, well, every individual is different. And, um, you know, you've got a real knack of being able to package those things, as I said, and maintaining good quality within it. Whereas too many people just package it and it's... You know, if anybody says you have to do it this way or this is the way it is done and this is the only way it can be done, then, you know, yeah, listen to them, but don't hang around too long because, you know, <laughs> yeah, got an open I, I would repackage what I just said to you then. If we were doing a study and we're going to eventually graph out change in behavior in a 50 minute session, um, then let's do it five minutes by five minutes. It's a five minute video. So it's test train then after five minutes you test again and then five minutes training then five you test again because people's they don't want to watch for the whole hour i want to have the whole hour of um so I, I started doing this and i filmed it all but then we ran into an editing jam um and now i'm down here and that our editors up there but they're editing stuff for the doggy school that we had to put online and what i amassed was a series of one hour sessions I have say with a dog dog reactive dog mm. um, 
solved it, one hour. Um, so I want to show three minutes before and after. Here's the dog before, here's the dog at the end, okay? But then I want to have available is I want them to watch the hour session. This session was actually an hour and 20 minutes. So they see what I did. And in that one, I remember one of them thinking of, we're filming in a warehouse and the owner of the warehouse, his son, is being a little passive aggressive. So he starts up a pneumatic drill. I'm not kidding. Here am I desensitizing a dog, dog, reactive dog. And in the same room you hear, doo -doo 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 -doo. so it's there. So I'm gonna have that up unedited. I will then edit it out for the before and after, but I'll say the sound's been edited out. If you want to see the real thing, what we actually went through, it's up there. And I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. But if you study, all of the behavior work should be filmed and available in real time, with no edits. It reminds me when I, you know, when I again when I moved to the university first off, I, I taught all the courses and did the practicals and whatever. And then you know, as as more staff arrives, the first thing you have to give up is the practicals because you're more expensive than the technician or whatever. Um, and I, I I do miss sort of that side. But one of the things I found was you know I try to explain to somebody you know how to train a dog to do something, and then they'd have a go and that no 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 you know this this that and the other and i always you know there are things that you do intuitively and a really good trainer can anticipate all you know there's that much greater awareness i i just sort of would do something and i don't know you know i the dogs seem to understand me for whatever reason they, we get on quite mm -hmm. well um but when the students would have a go if they'd got no experience and then i think oh, okay and I very quickly realized, actually, rather than me just demonstrate, they'll learn far more from all doing it oh, yeah. than me saying, look, that's what the issue is. Yeah, you know, people, there's too much stuff that's too polished, as you say. you got to see the warts and all, and then, you know, and that's what people can learn from. Because, And also they realize, yeah, we do screw up. We occasionally get our timing wrong. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the dog will forgive you. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like... I'm trying to stop telling people, you know, they've got a problem dog, you know, dealing with problem behavior. Say, look, you've got a dog that does this. Yes, you have had 10 dogs before. They've all gone swimmingly well. Now you've got a dog who's really going to teach you something. Isn't that great? You know, yeah. and you know, turn, the... turn it Sorry. from a negative into a positive. And, yeah. you know, and, and you know, don't, don't worry, you know, things will, yeah, things will go wrong. You will screw up, but the dog will forgive you. I think the best lecture I ever gave was in Japan. And when lecturing in foreign countries, I make sure I have a video for the whole seminar, you know, because mm -hmm. they can see it as I'm talking about it, because the waiting for sequential translation is like, I'd rather die. <laughs> you know, simultaneous translation is a lot easier, but it's not as accurate. So anyway, I made this video, um, lecture videos. And one of them I made was every single mistake that I made in training that I have on video. And I put it all together in a two hour video. And this had an incredible impact. People loved it. And I asked them why they said, well, it was so instructive hmm. that every time you did it wrong, we saw how you recovered to, to do it right. And we like watching it because it, it, it made you in Japan, of course, everyone sensei, you know, it made you, look human mm. we weren't so scared of you and i said you're scared of me and they thought yes sensei yes you know yeah. and i thought so the other day there was a comment on um at dunbar academy i think it was our top dog page so it's a private facebook page for people who subscribe to you know dunbaracademy.com so they can ask their questions of me and and i monitor it all anyway i, I received three emails there's this uh, someone said terrible things about you know uh, sirius so i go on and this lady just said sirius is outdated and so i you know wrote to her i mean i put her name up how you do it so that they get the message uh, what do you mean outdated um very old you know, obsolete, useless, or, you know, 
So do you just mean it's very old? And um, then I thought, well, hmm, it, it's very old. Yeah, so I, I wrote a post about it's very old. And you know what? We've changed hardly anything from it since we did it. Well, then I got a big, long reply back to her. It's all on Dunbar Academy. You can read the, the dialogue. I think, I think she was like Northwest European or Northern European, uh, pretty, pretty straight and narrow on her views, black and white. And she said, well, no, I don't. The original puppy training video is just so old. I said, yeah, it was the first one ever made, but everyone's making mistakes. And it's, it's, you know, I said, yeah, because that owners are oh, no you they should be doing it perfectly and you and all this she wanted perfection and I said oh, I get where you're coming from I said no I think absolutely the opposite there's no point in fact I don't allow trainers to demo what's the point of owners seeing a trainer demo and the dog looks great with them but hope you know I said no Owners work with their dogs the whole time and we talk them through it and they make loads of mistakes, but one by one we deal with them till eventually they can do it. That's our philosophy of, of training. And even when I take a dog to demo with, because it doesn't know me, it may blow me off. I may make loads of mistakes, but I find training is finding how to get over all these stumbling blocks and get something out of this dog that's improving its, its behavior. So I, I think, no, videos of screwing up with dogs is, yeah. is very, very valuable as a learning tool and much better than when they're screwing up. You know, I try and talk to them at the same time. I said, now, don't, don't worry. I'm just going to give you a running commentary what to do. I say, step back, step back, one step back. Some, good, call your dog, clap your dog, clap your dog. Say, up, 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 call your dog. That's it, call your dog. And I'm doing what they should be doing because the hardest things to teach is the intuitive stuff. You can do a sort of Teutonic step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, repeat 10 times, you know, we can write that. But no, dog training is you've got to intuitively give a running commentary to the dog. And that's much a harder thing to teach, but it really cements in my view that the only feedback really worth its salt is verbal because feedback has to be binary, but it has to be analog. You know, yes, we have to explain the dog, you're getting it right or you're getting it wrong, but also we have to explain how well you're doing yeah. or how damn dangerous that is when you get it wrong. You know, and so feedback must be analog. A click and a treat will never do it. Yeah. I'm sorry, that's boring. You, you, especially when used for something like dog, dog reactivity, that dog is so scared and stressed now and you're going click, treat, get out of here. What I'm gonna say is, oh, he's a brave boy. Yeah, you're very good. Come on, you wanna come here for a hug? Good boy. Because he didn't react. It's enormous. Yeah. The, the praise we have to give him is, is astronomical, you know? And I think it's a shame. And it's why I, I did that lecture. Um, what was it called? Science-based dog training with feeling. There's no reason why yeah. it can't be simple science, but absolutely scientific, you know, um, quantifying everything, but with feeling. Yeah. I, the voice has to be there. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. And I, it's just, yeah, one of the things in the clinic that, you know, I often say to clients is you've got a dog, you've got to have a sense of humor, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, we, and I think it was you who said, you know, the worst clients are the ones who are about as exciting as watching wallpaper dry because they yeah. just won't interact with the, you know, the dog. And you say, come on, let's have some fun. And again, it's about turning what they see as a problem into let's have some fun with the dog. Here are new opportunities, new ways of having fun. And, I found uh, the quickest way, and I, I discovered this quite by chance, I was teaching a canine games class, and this is a one-off, so my trainers could see me do it, and then they would be doing it. And so we selected graduates from Puppy 2. So you get an idea of that if you watch the old, the very old, almost obsolete, serious puppy <laughs> training um, video, you'll see graduates of Puppy 2, and you'll see the, the level of training I expected. Well, I got there, and none of the dogs had this level. I had two jump out of the training arena and run out of the facility. 
into the car parking lot. I mean, it was just, and I was furious. And Kelly says to me, Ian, calm, they, it's not their fault, you know, certainly not the owner's fault. But um, this was the trainers I was angry at, that you're not producing the sort of dog we should be producing. So I thought, well, what the hell do I do? I can't do it on leash now, you know, and I had to change all the exercises for, you know, I'm thinking it came in games class. We're going to put on uh, routines. We're going to have uh, recall races. We're going to play musical chairs, you know. So one of the things I added in was dance steps. And every week, I taught them three dance steps, stupid things. like get the dog to back away from you, to come here, to back away in a straight line, come here. Well, I'm being passive aggressive because I'm really pissed off that I'm not telling them how to teach the dogs to back away in a straight line. It's easy to not get them to back up. You just put the treat into their chest and they back pedal, but then they go crooked. So I thought I'm gonna leave it to them. I was watching them for a while and they were hilarious. I mean, I wish I could demonstrate now. Some were trying to block them with their leg like this, like back, 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 and that, all this sort of stuff, you know. Others, every time they went crooked, they went backwards and called the dog, come here, and started again. So others were getting a free recall. These were dogs that weren't, you know. So then at the end of the session, I put on music. I said, okay, this track lasts two and a half minutes, dance with the dog, I don't care what you do. So week three, so I'd now given them nine dance steps. So, you know, between the legs, got stationary figure eights, and then we got walking figure eights as you walk and all this stuff, twirl, twirl, circle round me, circle back. So week three, we're playing this dance um, tape. And I said to Kelly, look at them. Every dog's off leash, absolutely focused on the owner. And so from then on, that's how I teach off leash control. Just dance with your dog. And it, it can be dorky. And I found some of the really dorkiest people, like we actually have this on tape. It was a guy um, who did it as a, in the canine games as a demo but we saw him do it in class. I said, you should do this. He looks like an accountant and he comes on dressed like an accountant with an attache case. I mean, he really did it with glasses and his dog comes on wearing seven veils and then the music starts. <laughs> da, 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 da. And all he does is strip, takes off his glasses and throws them over here and his briefcase and he pulls a veil off the dog. And what's funny about it is he looks so dorky, but the dog is right there. Yeah. And you know what? The dog doesn't know a sit stay, doesn't know a down stay, but he had taught the dog to stay close to him off leash. And, and it's, I always say, you know, when I get kind of maudlin in a lecture and I realize my sunset years are coming along and I won't be lecturing or talking about this for much longer because I, like you, I obviously, I love it. Yeah. I say, you know, what would make me really happy is when being pushed along in a wheelchair and I'm really old now, <laughs> you know, and some nurse is taking me out, have a look. I see a guy on the street. And what would make it even better is if the guy's German and if his dog's a German shepherd and he's walking down the street like this, fuss, sits, fuss. <laughs> then he goes, bop, bop, a shoo, do, 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 do. Back from me to me, pause up and circle, circle, do, 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 do. fuss. And off he goes. <laughs> he just puts a little dance routine into his I said, that would make me feel that my time on this planet in some way has been worthwhile for just improving the lives of a few dogs and a few people. Uh, yeah, dancing with your dog. Well, I think on that note, that's a, <laughs> we're talking about sort of yeah. shuffling off the planet. Hopefully not yet, but that's probably a good point at which we should stop for tonight, shall we say? Well, as I could say in a coded fashion, if my beloved Zuzu were lying down beside me now and I got mm. up as I end this, she wouldn't follow me. <laughs> it's pressing. And I should probably say goodbye to everyone who's out there listening to this. Yeah. Thank you for bearing with Danny and I. We, 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 um, this is a delight for us. Um, we've known each other for a while. 
and we always seemed to just natter on and on, didn't we? Way, way back yeah. when, when you are mixing concrete for there me. Is, yeah, yeah, mixing concrete in the garden. But there's, um, it reminds me, there's a movie, um, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called Marvelous. And it's, no. it's a BBC movie, and it's, it's a true story about a guy called Neil um, is it Baldwin or something like that. And he's a guy with special needs, or you might say his learning difficulties, let's, let's yes. put it that way. And he just sort of, he knows people, and he's just sort of straight up with people. And he ends up as the kit man for Stoke City, he's a big Stoke City. But he, he turns up at the local university and pretends that he's a vicar, and he just gets to know everybody. And he yeah. um, he sets up his own football club and, you know, people are um, he's recruiting people and, um, you know, people, they say, well, you know, I played midfield, centre midfield. And, and, and this guy says, well, no, I play centre midfield. And he, no, he's, he's quite big, whatever, and he, old and, and everything. And he says, what do you mean? And he said, well, no, that's my position. Said, oh, well. But then he sort of um, one of his mates sort of phones up because he's got a friend. He said, oh, can you just help Neil? He's having difficulty recruiting for the football club and whatever. And the next thing you see, there's this massive queue of students because there's Gary Lineker there because he, he knows Gary Lineker, you know. Yeah. Um, but it is, I, I, one of my friends told me about the movie quite recently and I saw it and I just thought, yeah, I can relate to this guy because, you know, yeah. let's say when I came to the States, I just sort of bumbled along and as I said, I just sort of, I, I love, I love people, you know, and that's the thing. And then mm -hmm. I, as I said, um and just sort of accept people as as they are and it's okay to have differences of opinion you know you just let's just move on um and as always it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you and as i said i'm really grateful not just for tonight but for all the years that you know the crumbs you've thrown off your table towards me um, <laughs> you know um i've appreciated them as well and yeah let's do another one if if you're up for it um, absolutely thank you I, I really enjoyed it i was looking forward to it over the last couple of days and now i'm going out to my garden to put in a few little plants and then i'm going to crack a beer and well, my day continues well good and you you take care and don't shuffle off this planet just yet no god <laughs> no plans to do that then all right danny thank you very much good to speak to you take care all right. bye, bye. bye.